Good, probably morning by the time this post. Uh. Okay, well, I got as far as good morning um, before my dogs went crazy. So, uh, hello everybody. Um, this is the review for the geometry final. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, the odds on the um, final review and uh, a couple evens um, when uh, it's appropriate. So, start off with number one. So, this is, hey Cleo. Um, so, this is Cleo, my cat. She likes to yell at me. And apparently the fact that I'm out here at 10.45 or whatever making this video is, well, yell-worthy. So, anyway. So, we're talking about similarity. And remember what similarity means is that the sides are proportional and the angles are the same. So, you're not looking for the same um, size angles, you're looking for the relative size, you're looking for the same size angles, you're not looking for the same side of sides. So, when you're looking, <coughs> so you want to go, okay, well, are all the angles the same? Uh, because if all the angles are the same, then it is similar. If all the sides are proportional, two times as big, half as big, three times as big, whatever, then um, they are proportional. So we have three basic ways of determining proportionality, or similarity rather. We have side, side, side similarity. That means you have all three sides on both triangles, and when you compare the the ratio of the sides to each other, they're all the same. You have side angle side, which means you know that one angle is the same and the two sides that uh, form that angle are proportional and then you have angle angle similarity, um, which is really all three angles are the same. So, uh, because if, you, if two are the same, three are the same, it's one of the first things we learned. Uh, it's called the third angles theorem. Um, if two angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of another triangle, then the third angles are congruent. Um, so, anyway, let's look at number one. So, number one, we have our angles are the same 70 and 70. So, what we need to determine is whether or not the sides are proportional. So we look at 77 and 11 and 70 and 10. We want to compare that, you know, big to big, small to small. 77 divided by 11 is 7. So that, that proportion there, that ratio there is 7 to 1. The um, FED is 7, that side, FD, <coughs> is 7 times bigger than SU. So we then do 70 divided by 10, we get 7. So those are the same, 7 and 7. So we have a similar, we have a congruent angle and proportional sides. Therefore, we have similarity. So FED, it goes down the short side first. So we go down the short side, ST, U, and then we put by side, angle, side, similarity. Okay, so I also want to look at number 2. So number two, notice we have no clue what the angles are, um, but we do have uh, um, all three sides. So we're looking at side, side, side similarity here. So what we want to do is we want to set it up to where we're looking at, hold on. Small, medium, large, small, medium, large on each triangle. So we want to compare the two small sides. We want to compare the two medium sides. This is not being my friend today. And the two long sides, 143 over 39. 
so now what we're going to do is we're just going to see what that ratio is. So we grab our calculator, hit 87 divided by 24, and we get, well, it's 3.625, but... And then we go 88 divided by 25. Now, if this is anything other than 3.625, we know that it's the sides are no longer proportionate. If it is 3.625, then we're going to go and we're going to check the third side. And if they all equal 3.65, then we'll know that we have similarity by side, side, side. So here, though, 88 divided by 25 is in my butt 3.52 so we know that 3.65 does not equal 3.52 now i know sometimes especially when we're dealing with irrational numbers we kind of say oh that's close enough um here there are no irrational numbers here there is no estimation here we're not rounding anything one way or another um here we just have two ratios that aren't the same they're close but they're not the same. And since they're not the same, we don't have similarity. So all we do is we put no. Okay. Number three. Now, we're told ahead of time. You okay? So these are already similar. So we know that all the sides are proportional. What we're trying to figure out is X. So remember, if they're proportional, so HGF is similar to BCD. That means the ratio between HG and BC is the same as the ratio between GF and CD, which is the same as the ratio between HE, HF, and BD. Well, we know that we have BD and HF, and then we also know that we have BC and HG. So what we do is we apparently almost run out of batteries. Give me just a second, kids. Okay, we are back in business. We are recording. So uh, we know that the ratio, because they're similar, we know that the ratio of HG to BC is the same as the ratio between side HF and BD. Um, so, quick disclaimer here. Uh, if there's a problem that I don't cover that you need me to cover, just go ahead and email me and I'll, I'll post it tomorrow night um, or after school or at lunch, I don't know. Um, likewise, uh, if something doesn't make sense to you, try pausing, rewinding it, rewatching it a couple times, still doesn't make sense to you, just go ahead and email me and go, hey, Mr. Renard, I was looking at your walkthrough of number three, and I don't understand how you set it up, okay? And I will email you back, okay, I'll post something else, try and explain it better, or I'll just tell you that, too bad, I'm tired and I'm not doing it anymore. Probably not the second, but I reserve the right in extreme cases. So, anyway... We got HG, because they're similar, we know that this makes um, sense. Order matters. So the first two are, match up to the first two, the second two match up to the second two, and the first and third match up to the first and third. Those are the three sides of the triangle. So what we're doing here is we go HG over BC equals HF over BD. Plug in the numbers. So we have 140 over 50 equals negative 1 plus 33x over 35. And then we just cross multiply. So we have 140 times 35 equals 50 times HF, which is negative 1 plus 33x. So we do 140 times 35, and we get 4,900. We then distribute that 50, and we get negative 50 plus 1,650x. Add, and then it's just straight up algebra from here on out. Add 50 to both sides. Divide by 1,650. And we get x equals 3. Okay. And that's it. We got x equals 3. 
Um, sometimes it's going to ask for X, sometimes it's going to ask for the side length. That just asks for X, so we leave it there. Find the missing sides. So this next set are those special right triangles we dealt with, the 45, 45, 90, and the 30, 60, 90 triangle. With the 45, 45, 90 triangle, hope you guys remember that the ratio is 1 to 1 to the square root of 2. For some reason, the square root of 2 didn't show up. Um, the legs are the same. So here we know that one leg is 2, so the other leg is also 2. We also know the leg times the square root of 2. Come on, square root, show up. There we go equals the hypotenuse. So we go two times the square root of two, and we get two radical two. And that's X, and that's it. Literally, that's it. Um, there's a flow chart that you should have um, in your notes. Uh, it's pretty straightforward about, you know, when to multiply, when to divide, when to, you know, multiply by the square root of two over the square root of two. Uh, so make sure you have that in your notes. Um, make sure you have the flow chart for both 45, 45, 90, as well as 30, 60, 90 um, in your notes. Number seven. Okay. So here um, we don't have, it's a different ratio. So it's not one to one to square root of two. It's one to the square root of three to two. And that's the short leg to the long leg to the hypotenuse. Again, if you have that flow chart with you, uh, this becomes a lot easier. So here we're given the long leg. So if we look at that flow chart, we know that what we do with a long leg is we divide by the square root of 3 to get the short leg. Well, when we have a radical in the denominator, we need to rationalize our denominator. So what we do is we multiply by 1. Now, we pick a very special form of 1. Um, we're multiplying by 1, so we don't actually change the value. But we pick a very special form of 1 uh, that, excuse me, uh, that doesn't... Um, really, um, that gets rid of the radical in the denominator. So we have 10 radical 3, 10 over radical 3. We multiply that by the square root of 3 over the square root of 3. So up top, we just multiply straight across. 10 times the square root of 3, 10 radical 3. On the bottom, remember, when we multiply a square root by itself, we just get the number underneath, the radicand. Um, so that's 10 radical 3 over 3, and that's the short leg value. Now, to go from the short leg to the hypotenuse, we simply multiply by 2. So we take 10 radical 3 over 3 times 2, and that's going to equal the hypotenuse. Now remember, when we multiply a fraction by the whole number, uh, by a whole number, we just put the whole number over 1. Um, and then multiply across. So 10 radical 3 times 2 becomes 20 radical 3. And 3 times 1 equals 3. So that's our hypotenuse. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. 9. Uh, value of each trigonometric function. So the sine of z. Well, whenever we have anything relating to sine, cosine, and tangent, the, our trigonometric functions... I advise you to just sketch this down real quick. So Katoa, S-O-H, that's sine is opposite over hypotenuse. C-A-H, meaning cosine, is adjacent over hypotenuse. And T-O-A, which is tangent, is opposite over adjacent. So, okay, in all fairness, most, the vast majority of these are sine, if not all of them. Um, that will not be so on the final. So you need to be familiar and comfortable with not just doing sine, uh, but also working with cosine and tangent. So, um, whenever we have one like this, you want to draw, I like to draw a little dude on the angle that we're talking about. Since it's the sine of Z, I draw my little dude on Z. Remember, your little dude always stands on the corner of the hypotenuse and the adjacent, which leaves that as my opposite, Okay. So now we know that the sine of z equals opposite over hypotenuse. So in this case, it's 35 over 37. And from there, we uh, well, we'd actually go on to number 10. We're done. That's it. If it, all it's asking for is the ratio of the trigonometric function, that's all you have to put down. Um, 11. Now we're actually having to use sine, cosine, and tangent. So here, again, 
we're trying to find the measure of the degree. So we put our little dude down. Remember, standing on the corner of hypotenuse and adjacent, which makes 43 our opposite. Here we're given an angle, the opposite in the hypotenuse. Is that so? Is that ka? Is that toa? Well, opposite in hypotenuse is OH, so that puts me in so, which is sine. So we know the sine of that angle equals opposite over hypotenuse, or in this case, 43 over 45. Now, this is going to take some calculator work, okay? You cannot do this in your head. So the sine of the question mark equals 0.955555555, and so on and so forth. So it's important to realize that your any given angle has one and only one sign. Like 30 degrees has a sign of one half. Okay, what frequently gets lost in that is that only 30 degrees has a sign of one half. Okay, so it doesn't matter... Um, you know, when we're talking about these uh, trigonometric functions, if I see a sine of one half, I know for a fact that it's got to be 30 degrees. That's just how it works. Um, so... If I know that my sign is 0.9555, then I can actually ask my calculator, hey, calculator, what angle has this as its sign? So the way we do that is we hit second sign, and then this pops up, sign to the negative one power, open parentheses. You're then gonna hit second, and then the negative button, that's at the bottom right-hand corner of your calculator, and then this will pop up. And then you hit enter. And it tells you 72.8. Uh, we're supposed to go to the nearest degree. So it's 73 degrees. Okay, looking at number 13 then. So again, little guy on the corner of hypotenuse and adjacent that gives me again an opposite and a hypotenuse so we'll use a different color to distinguish between the two problems so here we know that the sine equals again opposite over hypotenuse 26 over 39 plug that into the calculator we get 0 0.6666666 so it's two-thirds basically And then we hit the second sign, second negative, enter. And it gives us 41.8 degrees or approximately 42 degrees. Remember that the question itself says round to the nearest uh, degree. So if we have 41.8, that is going to round up to 42 degrees. Okay, find the missing side, round to the nearest tenth. Same general idea, except instead of looking for the angle, we're looking for one of the sides. Again, it's important to know that every angle has a very specific sine, cosine, and tangent. And so you can use those to find the angle, or if you have the sides, or you can use them to find one of the sides if you have the angles. So here, number 15, little guy standing up there on the corner, looking around. He goes, hey, I just completely lost my train of thought, and apparently was hitting the wrong button. Okay, so we know the sine of 69 equals opposite over hypotenuse here. Opposite is X, H is hypotenuse, more clearly, 15. So the sine of 69 degrees is x over 15. So what I'm going to do in my calculator is I'm going to hit sine of, or actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by 15. And so I end up with x equals 15 times the sine of 69. Now, you can actually just type that directly into a whole interview. 
I have no, like, I'm literally falling asleep as I'm doing this, so if I make no sense, please understand that it's just me kind of dipping in and out of sleep, and I really have no control over what I say. So, um, you can just type that directly into your calculator, 15 sign 69, enter, and you get 14. It's like 14.001, but even if we're rounded to the nearest tenth, it's just 14.0. Um, 17, 18, and 19, you're asked to find the sum of the interior angles. Remember, this is done by treating each polygon like a whole bunch of different triangles and knowing that each one of the triangles is 180 degrees. Um, interior angles, sum of. So... So on this one, we start off with 17. We count the sides. We have nine sides, which means that we can make seven triangles. Okay, minor technical difficulties, but we're back. So what we do here is we count the number of sides. That's N. There are nine sides, so we have seven triangles. Multiply that by 180, and we get 1260. So if I added up all of the angles inside of that nonagon, I would get 1260 degrees. Now for number 19, we count, we get 12. Well, if we have 12 sides, then that makes we can, means we can make 10 triangles. Each one of those triangles has 180 degrees inner angles. And so the total is going to be 1,800. And just like that, we're on to number 21. Now, I'm going to do a couple of these uh, just because when we talk about translations, they're all different. So for number 20... Um, remember that that's the line y equals x, and that if we are reflecting across y equals x, each point we have x, y becomes y, x. We just switch them. Now, v right there is already on the line, so v doesn't reflect. But we take w, which is negative 3, 1, and that becomes 1, negative 3. We take x, which is five, negative 5, negative 3. And that goes to negative 3, negative 5. I will put the negatives in. Just give me a second. And that is what it looks like. Reflected across that line. So a dilation is when it's no longer a rigid, remember a rigid transformation is something like a translation, a rotation, or a reflection. It doesn't change the uh, size of the object. Uh, dilation does. It can either expand it or contract it. So this is K, that's our dilation factor. So when they say a dilation of and then they give you a number, that of number is um, the scale factor. So with a dilation, each point, x, y, you just take the scale factor and you multiply it by x, and you multiply it by y. And that new point that you get after you, um, after you uh, multiply your x and your y by the scale factor is going to be your new uh, point, your prime point. So, W, or, so what you do, what you can do, oi. So here, five halves is equal to 2.5. So you, the point is negative 1, 2. V is 1, 2. 
W is 1, negative 2, and T is 0, negative 2. So now we go and we multiply all of these by 2.5. So negative 1 times 2.5, negative 2.5. 2 times 2.5 is 5. And we do that for V. We do that for W. And we do that for T. And then we graph it. Put all our prime points up there. Connect the dots. And there you go. Make the a cat literally climbing on the tablet. So, translation. This is a slide. So those posts plus one and plus four there tells you what to do with each one. So here, K, we have negative four, zero. So what we do is we add one to the X. It becomes negative three. We add four to the Y. We get four. So what this means is we are moving the entire, or each point in the diagram one unit to the right and four units up. So we go from negative four zero to negative three four. L one over four up and J one over and four up. And that's it. Now, looking at number 23, um, it's important to remember kind of the rules for rotations. For 180 degrees, x, y becomes negative x, negative y. So we're going to do the same thing. L is 1, 0. So that's negative 1, 0. M is 4, negative 4. So that's going to become negative 4, 4. And finally, K becomes 1, negative 3. So that will become negative 1, 3. Plot them. And then on to number 27. So um, on these ones, you really do need to pay attention to, um, you need to have a working knowledge of vertical angles. Those are the bow tie angles um, that are the same. And then also, uh, you know, that half a circle is 180 degrees and be able to just kind of follow those through. So here on number 27, we're looking for CAD, this angle right here. Well, how we're going to do it is we look at BAF. So we know that BAF is 125 degrees. It's a central angle. It's described the arc described is 25 degrees. Um, 125 degrees. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the vertical angle of those two um, rays, BA and FA. And they go like that. So we know that CAE is also 125 degrees. Well, CAE is made up of two angles, CAD and DAE. Since we already know that DAE is 70, that means that CAD has to equal 55. Twenty-nine. So again, here we're looking at arc length. We know that these are central angles. So the arc length, and they're the measurement of the arc, um, the degrees in the arc, is the same as the angle itself. If this were a described angle, it would be a little different, but we're not talking about that. So what we do here is we look at um, Vs, and we see that Vs is a diameter. So we know that the two... 
um, angles we're looking at, WV, or W, yeah, arc WV and arc WS, have to add up to 180. So that's what we do. So here we know that x plus 47 plus 147 plus x equals 180. That's 2x plus 194 equals 180. So we add or we subtract 194 from both sides. We get 2x equals negative 14 divided by 2. We get x equals negative 7. That's perfectly okay to have a negative x as long as that doesn't make the entire um, calculation negative. But we're not done because we're asked to find the measure of wv. So we take that negative 7 so x plus 47 we know that x equals negative 7 Negative 7 plus 47 is 40. So the measure of arc WV is 40. So we get, okay, so here, um, the length of the arc. Now the formula for the length of the arc is the arc length equals the circumference times the number of degrees of the arc length that we're looking at, divided by 360. So circumference equals... Hey, Cleo. Oh, what's up, baby girl? So the circumference is 2 pi r. All of these were given the radius. So we double the radius here. The radius is 18. So the circumference of the circle is 36 pi miles. So that means that if you went all the way around the circle, you would travel 36 pi miles, which I think is about 81 or so. Oh, that's more than that. So it's about 113.1, but we're not going all the way. We're only going 270 degrees. So we multiply that 113.1 by the fraction of uh, what we're actually doing. Plug that into a calculator, we get 84.9 miles. 31, do the same thing, this time with 18. Or, sorry, 33, do the same thing, uh, this time with 11. Uh, we find an approximation of the... Okay, so 22 pi, approximately 69.1, multiply the circumference by the portion of the circle it's highlighted. In this case, uh, 225 degrees, and we have 43.2 kilometers. Okay, so it's important here that you remember how inscribed um, angles work. An inscribed angle, which is an angle inside a triangle that doesn't center on the center. So an inscribed angle, the arc it describes and the angle itself have a two to one relationship specifically. The arc is twice as big as the ring. So here we are looking for number 35. We're looking for X. Well, there are two different ways we can find X. We can either mathematically find what X has to be or in my case, and this is easier, um, we realized they already gave us two numbers, 70 and 162. And that covers all of the um, all of the circle except for that arc, VW, which is actually what we're looking for. Because we, if we can find that arc of VW, we cut it in half and that'll give us angle X. So here we know that all of them have to add up to 360. So we go 360 minus 70 minus 162. 
turn that into a little calculator moment. Beep, 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 beep. And we get the measure of arc VW being 128. Remember I just said, though, that's the arc. And the inscribed angle is going to be half of the arc. Um, so 128 divided by 2, 64. I don't know why I wrote 42 there at 64. The other way you can do it is you can cut in half the arcs they give you, 35, 81, and then subtract 180. Uh, subtract both of those from 180, and again, you'll get 64. Number 37. Uh, remember here that the arc is twice as big uh, as the angle. And we're looking for SRT. Notice that SRT is not the arc that we're describing. SRT is everything else. So if we start working our way backwards, one of the things you should see, one of the first things we did was um, just completely lost my train of thought. So anyway, we know we have to find SRT. So if we can find what um, ST is, uh, subtract that by 360, you're good to go. So here, um, we know that the arc is twice the angle length or angle measure, distribute the two. So we subtract 130x from both sides, we get negative 2x equals negative 2, or x equals negative 1, or x equals 1. So then when we're finding SRT, we first need to find out what ST is. Um, he was told it was, well, I'm really not making any sense here. Sorry, guys. Um, so we plug in that one into the 128X. So that gives us 360 minus 128 or 232 degrees. Now, keep in mind, that's everything except um, SU or ST, sorry. Okay, on to part number two. Part number two um, is all about uh, parallelograms, uh, rhombuses, rectangles, squares, trapezoids, uh, and that's it. So keep in mind, there are certain rules. You guys should have these written down. Parallelogram, opposite sides are congruent. Angles bisect each other. Um, with every... Again, train of thought. Sorry, guys. Um, so you need to know all of the different properties. So if the problem says, hey, this is a rhombus, you need to know that a rhombus is kind of a mix between a, um, a parallelogram uh, with four equal sides or a kite. Because remember, a kite is a quadrilateral with two sets of consecutive congruent sides. Well, since all four sides in a rhombus are congruent, it makes sense. Um, so anyway, so, you know, if it's a rhombus, you know that the uh, diagonals bisect the... Um, the diagonals bisect the corner angles, things like that. Um, so look at number 15. So number 15 is just a run-of-the-mill parallelogram. And we know that opposite angles are congruent. So we have 17. Um, so we just set these equal to each other because opposite angles are equal. 17 equals 4x minus 39. Add 39 to both sides. 
56 equals 4x divided by 4, and we get x equals 14. Now, we're not done yet because we the problem says solve for n. So we go back and plug in our 14 to whichever we think is going to be the easiest um, to do the math. So we have 8 times 14 plus 17. So it's going through all this. But yeah, so, um, so what we did was we found out that angle M and K are both 129 degrees. We knew that where Louis was standing, he was likely to take the brunt of... Again, wow, I'm just like falling in and out of like weird daydream sleeps. Anyway, so 180 minus 129 is 51. 17, um, parallelogram, A, B, C, D. So again, here we're looking at the diagonals. Now in a parallelogram, we know the diagonals, um, they don't have to be congruent, but we do know that they bisect each other. It means they cut each other in half. So here we have E, D, and B, D. So we know that E, D is going to be half of what BD is. So what we do is we double ED and set that equal to BD. So distribute that two, so we get 14X minus 13, 26. And again, we're doubling it to get make it equal to the whole thing. And then BD is 16X minus 38. Algebra, we're gonna subtract 14X from both sides. Add 38 to both sides. 12 equals 2x divided by 2, and we get x equals 6. Now remember, we're not being asked to find x here. We're being asked to find the length from point B to point D. Since we already know that B to D is 16x minus 38, we simply just drop our x equals 6 in there. And, from, and then math it out. And we get BD equals 58. I mean, go back and check that if you plugged in that 6 for ED right here, uh, that it would be half of 20, 58, or um, 29. Okay, moving on, 19. So PQRS is a rectangle. A rectangle has four right angles. It is an equilangular, equilateral. Uh, that being said, it also has the special property of the uh, diagonals being congruent to each other. So if we can find out, um, now they still cut each other in half because it's still a parallelogram. Um, but if we can um, so anyway, just to the problem. So here okay, so Unslapped my computer again, and here we go. So PQRS is a rectangle. PR, that's one diagonal, and QS, um, they have two diagonals. Now we just went over the fact that the two diagonals are congruent. So PR is equal to QS. So we just set them equal to each other. 9x plus 1 equals 13x minus 11. Subtract a 9x from both sides. So we have 1 equals 4x minus 11. Add 11 to both sides. 12 equals 4x. Divide by 4, and we get x equals 3. Now remember that TR, because even though it is a rectangle, it's still a parallelogram. So the diagonals still bisect each other. So TR is going to be one half of what PR is. So we find out what PR is, 9 times 3 plus 1. We, plug, we just solved for x equals 3, so we plug that in. And that gives us 27 plus 1, or 28. We know that TR is half of that. So we do 28 divided by 2. 
and we get 14. And that's your answer. Boop. On to number 21. So, uh, JKLM is a rhombus. So, rhombus, when we're talking about the... Um, still all the same rules apply for a parallelogram. Opposite angles are equal. Consecutive angles are supplementary. Uh, diagonals bisect each other. Opposite sides are parallel. Um, but we added some new ones. So, rhombus, all four sides are the same. And because of that, because it's, it's like the kite, so these are inherited from a kite, the diagonals bisect um, the corner angles and um, the diagonals are perpendicular. Um, so that angle right there in the middle and all four of those are going to be 90 degrees. So JKL, uh, because we know that it's a rhombus, um, we know that uh, the diagonals bisect the corner angles, so those are 36, 36. We also know, um, so 36 plus 36 is 72, JKL. MLK, right there. So we know that MLK and JKL are consecutive angles, which means that they are supplementary. So we go 180 minus 72, and we get 108. JMK is right there. Um, so that's half of the one opposite where we started. And because it's a parallelogram, we know that opposite angles are congruent. So um, it has the same setup as across 36, 36. The other two were 54, 54. And around the middle is 90 degrees. So then we can just fill the rest of them in like that. Um, so make sure you guys should have in your notes all the different properties of all the different parallelograms. Um, and kites and trapezoids and things like that. So And those are going to be needed. So number 23, you have STVU is a rhombus. So again, find SVU. So we know that SVU is going to be the same as um, the top angle, STU, because they're opposites. Uh, we know, as we just said, that the diagonals bisect the corner angles. So you've got STW and UTW there, so those are going to be equal to each other. So when something bisects something, it cuts it in half. So we have 9x minus 43 equals 5x plus 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for x. We're going to use x to find one of those. Um, e either 9x minus 43 or 5x plus 1. Um, we're going to double that, and that's going to give us STU, which will also give us SVU, because STU and SVU are congruent. Uh, subtract 5x from both sides. So we have 4x minus 43 equals 1. Add 43 to both sides. And we get 4x equals 44. Divide by 4, and we get x equals 11. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug that into 5x plus 1. So that's 5 times 11 plus 1. 55 plus 1, or 56. So we know that UTW is 56. Um, if we had plugged in the 11 onto the other side, we would have gotten 99 minus 43, also 56. Um, so together, we double that. We get 112, and that is both STU and SVU. So that's our answer. Number 25, um, squares. So here, squares are pretty easy because um, each one of those little triangles is a 45-45-90 um, triangle because it is both a uh, rhombus and a rectangle. So all those rules that we just talked about with rhombuses about the uh, diagonals splitting evenly, the corner angles, about the diagonals being um, perpendicular, all of those things are still true. 
And then we add in the fact that it's a rectangle as well, so it's equal lateral and equal angular. So it means that all four of the corner angles are 90, which when you split them in half makes them 45. So you end up with just a whole bunch of 45, 45, 90 triangles. And then you basically, woo, that's a bit much. So then you can just basically go through and figure out which angle is which. If it's a corner angle or a center angle, it's 90. If it's one of the split angles on the corner, it's 45. So 27. Um, so trapezoids, uh, the important thing to know about trapezoids is that it has one set of parallel lines. And so when you have this, um, like PS right there acts basically as a transversal between those two parallel lines. So you end up having uh, same side interior angles. Well, if you remember from first semester, when two when a transversal crosses two parallel lines, um, same side interior angles are congruent. Um, so we know that each one of the top and bottom angles are supplementary, meaning they add up to 180 degrees. So all we have to do to find Q is subtract 41 from 180. Then we get 139. To solve for S, we subtract 104 from 180. And we get 76. So for number 29, we notice that angles G and H right there, they're the same kind of deal. They're uh, same side interior angles, which means they're supplementary. So we're going to solve for x by setting these. We're going to add them up. Set it equal to 180. And go from there. So 13x equals 156. Divide both sides by 13. And we get x equals 12. Now keep in mind that's not enough. Um, because we're asked to find angle H, which is 94. So we just take that 12, plug it back in. And there we go. For 28 and 30, same general idea. Uh, but because the two um, legs is what they're called, you have the bases and legs and the trapezoid, because the two legs are congruent, it's an isosceles tra trapezoid. Um, it means that these two angles, the top and the bottom angles are the same. Uh, they're congruent. So here, those would be supplementary, but H and G are the same. Um, moving on. Okay, so that's it for the review. Um, if you have managed to stick with it, and watch all this. I want to give you guys just a little bit of a kind of a heads up or a, a start on how we uh, do this. Um, so when we're looking at a big problem like this, so we have 21 different angles that we have to figure out. Um, we're, we're looking with angles. So, so we know that our central angles are going to be the same as the arc they describe. We know that our inscribed angles are going to be half the arc that they describe. And we look in there and we see all these triangles and we know that triangles have to add up to 180. So um, there are a bunch of givens here. So go around and kind of mark off all the givens. And so I'm just going to do a couple of these. So I'm going to start off with um, 16. So see how 16 is a central angle and it describes that 105 degree arc. Well, we know that if it's a central angle, the arc length and the, or the arc measure and the central angle measure are the same. So 16 is 105. Likewise, 17 is gonna be 27. Now we know that 15, 16, and 17 together, right here, form a straight line. That's 180 degrees. So we go 180 
minus 105 minus 27, and that gives us 48. So that 15 is 48 degrees. So if 15 is 48, then we know that A to F, arc A to F is 48 degrees. And if arc AF is 48 degrees, well, if we look over at angle number six, we see angle number six is an inscribed angle describing a 48 degree arc, which means that it's going to be half of that, or 24. Well, now we have 17 and 6, 24 and 27, so we can add those up and we can solve for 18, 129, which is we want 180 because we know that 17, 18, and 6 have to add up to 180. We already had two of them, so we subtracted 180. Uh, we took 180, subtracted 24, subtracted 27, and we got 129. We'll look at 18 and 20. Those are vertical angles. So if 18 is 129, why 20 is 129 too? We can then use 18 and 20 to solve for 21 and 19. We know that 18 and 21 and 18 and 19 are supplementary. So we go 180 minus 129, and we get 51. And I think that's it. Um, yeah, so that's basically how you do this. You, you use those, so like for me, the next one I would do would be um, angle 7, because I already have 16 and 21, so I can then solve for angle 7. Um, and then I know that, you know, because um, angle AFD describes, it's inscribed, it's an inscribed angle, which describes the diameter, so I know that AFD is a right angle, so once I find 7, I can find 8. Once I find 8, I have 15 and 8, and I can solve for 9. <coughs> I can also solve for 9 as it's an inscribed angle that's describing a 132-degree arc. So it would be, you know, 66 degrees. Um, so you, basically what you want to do is just kind of methodically, Cleo says goodnight, uh, methodically go through these. Um, take your time again. So if you have any questions, go ahead, uh, email me, come at lunch, um, let me know, uh, because we got, you know, depending on what class you're in, about, you know, 72 to 96 hours left uh, to get your grade up. So um, it has been wonderful teaching you all. I hope you all have a good morning, good day, and kick butt on your finals, and we'll see you in class.